Hi, and welcome to today's lesson, Rethinking the Timing of Jesus' Crucifixion. In this lesson, we're looking at the timeline of events during Jesus' last week from his Last Supper all the way through the timing of the resurrection. We're harmonizing the different gospel accounts and challenging the idea of Good Friday. Here's the problem. Harmonizing all of the gospel accounts of Jesus' final week has really been a challenge for Bible students through the centuries. In fact, this has been one of the most discussed and most debated issues when it comes to the divinity of Scripture because the timelines don't seem to align at first glance. Questions like this, on which day of the week was Jesus actually crucified? And when was he resurrected? We know that he's seen on the first day of the week, but when does he actually ra rise from the grave? And on which day of the week was Jesus' last supper? And when was the last supper the actual Passover meal? Do the Gospels provide the same or different timelines? Are they, in fact, harmonized? On the surface, John's Gospel account seems to contradict the others, but there's good news, and it's time to rethink the timing of the Last Supper. Let's look at the different accounts from Matthew, Mark, and Luke first, and what they have to say about the timing here. In Matthew's account, chapter 26, verse 17 through 19, I'll be reading from the New King James translation. It says, On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Mark's account from chapter 14, verse 12 through 16 reads similarly. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will greet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as they had, as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. And here's Luke's account from Luke 22, verse 7 through 13. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, so we learn the two disciples here that were sent were Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will greet you, carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. So you can see that there is strong similarities. In fact, these three accounts provide minor detail in terms of variance between one another. They pretty much say the same thing. And so our initial reaction when we study just these three is, wow, this is great, it's fantastic, it's amazing. Uh, Jesus did exactly as it says in all three accounts, and they ate the Passover together on the day that the Passover lamb was to be killed. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are virtually identical. 
But the problem is that John's account is quite different. In fact, he adds quite a bit of additional detail that uh, tells us that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are either incorrect or we don't understand them the right way. John says in John chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, and then skipping down to verse 26 through 29, now before the feast of the Passover, this is at the Last Supper, this is when Jesus was sitting with the twelve and his disciples and they were enjoying that last meal together, and Jesus was about to finish up and, and grab the towel and uh, wash the disciples' feet and begin to teach them about these final things before he would go to Gethsemane and be arrested. And John tells us there that uh, the time of the Last Supper was before the Feast of the Passover. Continuing to read, Now before the Feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and he should that he should depart from this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then verse 26 through 29, it says, And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he had said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, Buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after the Last Supper, once again, we see from John that those surrounding the table who were wondering why Jesus told Judas to go do what he was going to do quickly, they were thinking that Judas was going to buy something for the feast, the Passover feast. And so we see again another reference. And then there's this one. Later on, several chapters over, after Jesus is on trial and he's standing before Pilate as they lead the Jewish leaders lead Jesus into the praetorium and uh, he's faced the all night of testing and trial and false witness in John 18 verse 28 it says then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium and it was early morning but they themselves that is the Jews that were escorting Jesus did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke say that Jesus wanted to tell the disciples to prepare the Passover so that they could eat that together, uh, John is clear that the Passover was not yet to be had. In fact, not even at the time of Jesus' crucifixion had the Passover yet occurred. And so these four different accounts don't seem to fit. But I have good news, and that is that all of these gospel accounts can in fact be harmonized and that their timelines are actually consistent. I have studied this for years, and this is still the only way that I can make all of these events fit with what the scriptures tell us. So let me show you how it works. So basically we have a four-day framework that we're dealing with. A th Thursday, rather, Thursday through a Sunday, and the dates were abib, or in some places after the Jewish captivity in Babylon, the month name was changed to Nisan, or N-I-S-A-N, I believe that's how you pronounce it, Nisan, uh, Nisan, whatever. But in the early uh, law, uh, the month name was Abib. Some translations you'll see the B substituted with a V, a Viv. Uh, regardless, uh, that's the word that I'm using here to help us understand. And the reason I'm using that is because when we read it in the law, 
this is the name of the month that's referenced and it helps us to have an understanding of from the time of Moses this was the custom that God gave to the Israelites another thing to consider with this framework is the way that days worked according to the Jewish uh, system of marking time the Jews unlike the Romans and unlike our calendar today the Jews marked days from sunset to sunset we see this in the Genesis account in the creation account of Genesis it says in Genesis 1 and verse 5 with the first day of creation it says God called the light day and the darkness he called night so the evening which is mentioned first and the morning were the first day and so in our timeline here it's important to remember that we have to kind of reverse the way that days work today with our system of measurement and remember that nighttime would come before the daytime in that particular day now we're mixing systems here it's not that the Jews would use the words Thursday Friday and Saturday and Sunday but I'm trying to translate from what we have in the early scripture in the Genesis account and in the law of the timing with what we understand today and so that we can uh, get to the time when the Passover will be celebrated each year and look at how that lines up with the way that it worked in the year that Jesus was crucified. So bear that in mind that Thursday evening comes before Thursday morning and so forth. The next thing that we have to keep in mind is that according to the law in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 6 for example we see that the Passover celebration the Passover meal it was kept as the day was transitioning from a bib 14 into a bib 15 so I kind of placed a general bracket around those last few hours on both sides because the meal would have been uh, started preparations as the day was still in Abib 14 and then the meal actually eaten and enjoyed at twilight after the the day had begun transitioning into Abib 15 uh, the next day and then on top of this we have the fact that the Feast of Unleavened Bread which the Passover was the first day that joined then into a seven day feast that began on the 15th of Abib and continued through the 21st and this comes from Leviticus 23 and verse 6 uh, it tells us on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord seven days that's the length of the feast you must not uh, or you must eat unleavened bread so they were to get all the leaven out of their house and no leaven could be in their possession during this seven day period and of course they would purge it before then and this is where we get into the the next uh, important concept that comes up is uh, there are a couple of um, days that are mentioned that are terms that are specific that we, we don't understand these because we're not used to the Jewish culture and the first of these is that in Matthew's account and I think perhaps the other two as well uh, it tells us that that on the day the first day of the feast of unleavened bread the disciples came to Jesus and said where do you want us to prepare for, for you to eat the Passover and this first day I'm submitting to you was actually Thursday, Abib the 14th, and that this day is known as the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And part of the reason for this is because that was the day when the leaven would be purged. It was also the day when the preparation and the execution of the Passover would begin and that's the reason why culturally it became known as the first day of the feast in John chapter 19 and verse 14 uh, we see also another term used for this same day and it's called the preparation day of the Passover so that makes sense and so there's another day 
term that we layer on top of our existing framework, which is the Passover or the preparation day of the Passover. And in another place, we'll see it referred to as the, pass, uh, the preparation day for the Sabbath. Here it is in John chapter 19, verse 31. And this is key to the understanding because what we have here is there are actually a couple of Sabbaths that we have to be concerned about and on top of that a preparation day for the Sabbath and I'll explain more of that as we go but the first of these this preparation day it was this same Thursday it was the same Abib 14 the preparation day of, of <clears throat> that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath for that Sabbath was a high day now we're used to thinking about Sabbath equating to Saturday but in fact, when we study the law, when we study the instructions that God gave around this Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the first day and the last day of the feast were Sabbaths. They were special Saturday, or special Sabbath days, rather, not Saturday in this case because of the way that the, the days fell. Uh, I reference here on the screen. Mark chapter 15 and verse 42 and since I don't have that verse on the slide I'll read it for you it says now this is the burial of Jesus it was the preparation day that is the day before the Sabbath so as evening approached and then it continues into verse uh, 43 Joseph of Arimathea uh, and I'll paraphrase he goes and, and asks for the body of Jesus so we'll cover that again in a bit but the preparation day there or the Sabbath that is occurring is not Saturday it would actually have been Friday in this case so let's start th now that we have the framework here let's start throwing some events on here from what the Gospels tell us they first tell us as we read already from Matthew 26 verse 17 that the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is when the disciples came to Jesus and they said where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover so I have placed this question to Jesus as early in the evening meaning shortly after the day has transitioned and so this is early in the day the 24 hour period of Thursday Abib, Abib 14 they come to Jesus and ask this question previously uh, before I studied all of these things and put this timeline together some years ago, I understood, I kind of pictured them asking Jesus this question in the morning and then kind of having all day to prepare. But that's not actually what the scriptures show. It, it indicates that the time between them asking Jesus this question and when they sat down for the meal is probably not all that long but but practically probably a few hours transpire between that question and the Last Supper. Uh, Mark's account of it says uh, that on the first day of unleavened bread when they killed the Passover lamb uh, his disciples said to him this is Jesus uh, it, disciples it's referring to where do you want us to go and prepare that you might eat the Passover. So on top of this we see that um, it gives us further clue that this first day of the feast is also the same day when the Passover lamb was killed and that's how we know that this day would have had to have been a bib 14 because that's when the Passover lamb was killed Luke's account tells us the same thing uh, they they came then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed and uh, he sent Peter and John go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. Now, as I said, I don't think much time uh, passes in terms of the whole day, 24 hour period. I believe this is still early, you know, um, they asked the question early in the evening, they sit down a few hours later, and uh, they the meals are everything's already prepared in the room Jesus tells us and so it tells us in Matthew 26 verse 17 when the evening had come Jesus sat down with the 12 and they were as they were eating and this is the last supper when Jesus sets up the Lord's Supper and uh, and then of course as John tells us washes the disciples feet in Mark's account it says in 14 17 in the evening he came with the 12 and they sat and ate 
And then in Luke's account, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And then John, again, tells us that this is before the feast of the Passover uh, when this event takes place. And so that's where I place this uh, Last Supper on the timeline relative to Jesus' whole last week. And then later on, we know that significant events take place at the Last Supper. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He begins to uh, have the dialogue with Judas about the betrayal. Judas goes out, and then they sing a song, and they head out to uh, the Mount of Olives. And Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, where he is uh, understandably distraught, and he is brought to the point of sweating drops of blood. And he arises from his prayer as the angels are comforting him, and uh, he says to those who approached uh, out of the gate, and this is really powerful when you picture when you can actually see where the Garden of Gethsemane is relative to the eastern gates of the temple where the the, the mob probably came from because it, it being nighttime, uh, then they wouldn't have been able to see too well. And of course, they have, probably have all these torches and clubs and and uh, and swords as, as the scripture describes here. So they, they have all this stuff and they're coming down. And so Jesus would have been able to see because there's a significant elevation difference between the eastern wall of Jerusalem down through the Kidron Valley and up on the uh, side of the Mount of Olives where the Garden of Gethsemane is, where Jesus is uh, praying and he's watching, waiting for the betrayal. So we have all the events during the night and we know that it was the next morning uh, that at the third hour uh, that Jesus was crucified, the third hour of the day. Now what's interesting here is that in Mark's account and some of the others, uh, Jesus, or, or the, the, the gospel writer rather, uh, begins to switch to, to probably Roman custom because the Romans measured the, the day from sunrise to sunrise. And so it's interesting, and what I piece from this is that most likely the descriptions of the the feast related stuff is kind of the Jews having to revert back the gospel writers reverting back to their heritage and what they knew from uh, observing the law and the Jewish timeline and then as they describe the events that take place around Jesus crucifixion and during the daytime they begin to describe it using terms that were Roman customs of the day uh, and that does seem to be consistent. But regardless, we know that it was the third hour, about 9 a.m., when Jesus was crucified. He's on the cross for uh, six hours, and darkness is on the face of the earth for the last three hours. And it's at the ninth hour that Jesus cries out and he breathes his last. And so this is around 3 p.m., on this Abib 14 uh, as we're getting ready to transition before long. What's amazing, this is so powerful when I discovered this, is that according to Josephus, who was the Jewish historian that lived during the first century and uh, discussed the Jewish culture and Jewish traditions according to the law as of that time, and he also documented the Roman war with the Jews and the destruction of Jerusalem and the city in 70 AD time frame, uh, Josephus recorded that this same hour, this uh, ninth hour, was the very time when the high priest across uh, there with in Jerusalem, across with all the sacrifices that would have been brought, all the Passover lambs that would have been prepared, uh, this, the, the high priest would begin to kill those sacrifices uh, from the ninth hour until the eleventh hour, uh, which would have been 5 p.m. as the day is getting ready to transition, the Jewish day. So what that means is Jesus would have died on the cross at precisely the moment that the Passover lambs would begin to be slaughtered. And the first time I saw this connection, I was just... I, got, I had chills. I still have chills, even describing it now, even though it was years ago when I realized this, because it brings deep meaning 
to Jesus as our Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul references this, and he says, For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. And so, you know, when you understand that it was very literally the exact time that uh, the Passover lamb is being, is being slaughtered, the true Passover lamb, the one through whom the blood of all of those physical lambs uh, had any meaning and had any power and significance, he too was being slaughtered according to the will of God. So here we have the evening come, and it hasn't quite transitioned yet from uh, this Abib 14 into Abib 15 because it still refers to this same day when Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. So this this decision of Joseph to go to Pilate had to have happened within a few hours of Jesus' death upon the cross um, as this day is getting ready to transition. And this is important because this would have made uh, Joseph unclean for actually eating the Passover himself because he would have been uh, in contact with a corpse, which was uh, caused the person to become ceremoni ceremonially unclean according to the law. John 19 and verse 31 says, Because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross for the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. Uh, because it was the beginning of the feast, it was again not Saturday, it was actually Friday. And this Sabbath, this high day, is a reference to Abib 15, uh, which, as we saw from Exodus chapter 12 and verse 16, it is specified in the law that no one was to do any work on this day, and it was also to be a day of a, an assembly of uh, everyone before the Lord. Then, as the day transitions and the evening comes, the actual Passover meal would have been eaten. The Passover lamb had not been slaughtered yet when the disciples sat down for the Last Supper. So here the next day uh, we have the Passover lamb being eaten on that evening, the evening of Abib 15 after it was sacrificed just a few hours earlier or slaughtered a few hours earlier. And it says in Exodus 12 and verse 8 when God set this up with Moses, then they, that is the children of Israel, shall eat the flesh of the Passover lamb on that night, roasted with fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. We fast forward to the next day, so through the night everything is fine. The next day is going to be again this um, first day of, uh, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread in terms of the actual feast observance, not the preparation for it. But the next day, which is the uh, followed the day of preparation for the Passover, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together uh, to Pilate, and they advised Pilate to put the, the stone in front of the tomb. And they said, Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So that would have happened on this Friday. And then we fast forward, you know, nothing happens uh, during the, the Saturday Sabbath rest. So we have two Sabbaths that occur in a row uh, after this uh, initial preparation days that we talked about. And in Matthew 27, verse 62, we see that Jesus is first seen. He is first appears to Mary uh, Magdalene and the other Mary. And in Matthew 27, 62 through 66, there we read that it's after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. As they went to his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. So, we know that Jesus is first seen around dawn on the first day. We don't know exactly uh, when Jesus was resurrected other than just that it seems to have been uh, clearly based on the timelines and Jesus' own prophecy. It had to have been during the Jewish 
uh, a bib 17 for some time between sunset to sunset and uh, when you throw in the date timelines uh, or you know the prophecies that Jesus made um, it becomes clear that it had to have been close to this time frame when Jesus was arrested so here it is all together this is the timeline Jesus actually would have been crucified not on Good Friday as is tradition but actually on Thursday because this is the only way that I can make all of the gospel accounts harmonize and say the same thing. And what else is cool, as I have alluded to so far, is that this also, this timeline is also consistent with Jesus' own prophecy that, like the sign of Jonah, he would be in the grave three days uh, and three nights. So the three days here has a bib 14, 15, and 16, or if you choose to shift it a little, then it can be 15, 16, and 17. And the three nights, which you don't get with the traditional timeline of Jesus dying on uh, Good Friday, uh, with this timeline, you do, because Jesus was in the grave before Friday. He, w he was in the grave Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. Uh, or, excuse me, he was in the grave Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. It still gets confusing, uh, even despite doing all of this study, because I forget, uh, even though I have it in front of me, I forget that the evening comes before the morning sometimes. So, the early part of Friday was the evening. So Jesus was in the grave Friday, Saturday, Sunday evening, and then Sunday morning is when he is seen resurrected. And as I said, Matthew 12, verse 40, Jesus himself said this, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here's the conclusion of all of this. When we put all of these things together, it makes some pretty powerful points. The Last Supper that Jesus enjoyed with the disciples was not the actual literal Passover meal. It couldn't be. John explicitly says that the Last Supper was over before the Passover actually occurred. And we know from the other accounts that Jesus was uh, crucified before the Passover was even celebrated. Uh, John also mentions that the Jews did not want to go into the praetorium because they didn't want to defile themselves so that they could eat the Passover. So what this means, in my conclusion, is that those references that Jesus makes to the meal that he observed with his disciples were actually much like you or I saying that we would have Christmas dinner with our friends on like December 23rd or 24th. It's not the literal Christmas day and so we're not actually celebrating the literal Christmas Day dinner, but we're celebrating a Christmas season dinner. And I think this is, this is clearly what, what Jesus must mean. We also know uh, that the Passover lamb could not be killed inside the city gates. Deuteronomy 16, verse 2, verse 5, and 6 are specific about that. So even if the Last Supper timeline aligned, John and Peter, they would have had to kill the Passover lamb outside the city. So that means that Luke 22 and verse 13 there is not possibly referring to killing of the lamb when you're talking about preparing uh, the setup. Also, Abib 14, which is the preparation day of the Passover, is the day when the leaven would, been, would have been removed from the Jews' houses. So it is possible that the Last Supper featured unleavened bread, but we can't prove this one way or the other. Two things that I think go against this are the fact that, number one, uh, Jesus is seen dipping the bread uh, with the disciples and that's the sign that he gave to prove that it was Judas who was the betrayer and I don't know if you've ever tried this but unleavened bread does not dip too well and so it just seems unlikely that that would fit the description there 
The other thing is that when you consider the fact that Abib 14 had just begun, according to my timeline, where they actually ask Jesus and then sit down, uh, this being the preparation day when the leaven was removed, my guess is that the actual removal of the leaven in most cases was done after they spent the night and woke up on this preparation day the next morning. So they would have almost had to have removed the leaven on Abib 13 to get it out of the house before these events took place. And I don't think that that is likely because that sort of defeats the purpose of the removal of the leaven. It was a symbol to remind them of the importance of the elimination of sin as they approached the Lord. We've already highlighted the fact, but it's important to note it again, that this timeline makes it so that Jesus dies at the very hour that the Passover lamb was being slaughtered. This would be consistent with the way that God works and the symbols that he gave, the shadows under the old law, which under the new covenant have special meaning and point to things that were fulfilled in Jesus. And that's the reason why Christians don't have to observe these Mosaic feasts anymore. Jesus fulfilled them. And so it makes absolute sense that Jesus, who took on the role of the Passover lamb in providing the sacrificial blood that allows the death angel to pass over us and spare our lives eternally and have the forgiveness of sin, that Jesus would die at the very same time that this lamb would be sacrificed. I hope this has been helpful for you. If you want more resources such as uh, downloads of these videos, audio recordings, Bible study questions, and many other resources, check out my Patreon site, patreon.com slash chasing a lion.